to go over a projectile motion also, but unlike the previous video in which we fired a object horizontally off of a cliff, in this particular video I'm going to fire, show you how to analyze an object that's being shot off at an angle, theta, um, off the ground. So let's start off by drawing it out for ourselves and saying that we have, there's a ground, And we've got an object, let's say it's a cannonball, it's being fired off at an initial velocity v i, some value, 30 meters per second, 40 meters per second, 50 meters per second. And it's being shot at an angle of theta. That theta could be anything, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees. And so this ball is going to travel just like the projectile you fired in your logger pro activity. But I want to look at it from um, the analysis perspective of vectors. I want to talk to you a little bit about it from that perspective. So whenever you run into a situation like this, the first thing you should always do is take your vector, velocity of the vector, so you want to break that up into its horizontal and vertical component. You want to break it up into its x and its y component. Some people call it the horizontal component and the vertical component. Some people call it the Vx and the Vy. Basically, the ball has been fired at a velocity, Vi. It could be 20 meters per second, 30, 40, whatever you want to make it, 40 meters per second. But you want to find out how fast is that ball traveling sideways. And you want to find out how fast is the ball traveling up. What is its initial velocity upwards? And what is its initial velocity sideways? So the initial velocity sideways, we're just going to simply call it Vix. And the initial velocity upwards, we're just going to call it Viy. Keeping in mind that the velocity in the x direction, the horizontal velocity, is not going to change because we're neglecting air resistance. However, the vertical velocity is going to change. The vertical velocity as the ball goes up is going to diminish because gravity is accelerating everything downwards at all times. No matter where the ball is, at the highest point, at the beginning, wherever it is, gravity is always pushing that ball downwards. It's always accelerating that ball downwards. So the vertical velocity is going to get weaker as it goes up. And when the vertical velocity completely becomes zero, that point is considered your highest point. Why? Because the thing, the velocity that was responsible for pushing you upwards, has now become zero. So it's disappeared. So there's no velocity left to push you upwards. So you can't go any higher. That's why it's called the highest point. And all throughout this, the horizontal velocity is going to stay the same. So basically, as this ball goes through the air, right here, 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 let me draw you from a vector perspective what those horizontal and vertical velocities would look like. So first of all, your horizontal velocity is just going to be, at all times, this is going to be identical to this. So let me draw that on there first. Now let's talk about the vertical velocity. Well, the vertical velocity will get weaker. So just like I drew this head to tail, you can draw it head to tail right here. This is going to get weaker, smaller than this. Some people draw it here, some people draw it right here. It doesn't make a difference. At any point, if I ask you what's the final velocity, all you've got to do is Pythagorean theorem and give me the hypotenuse. That would be the true velocity of that ball. It won't, it'll won't. it take into account both the horizontal and the vertical when you do Pythagorean theorem. That's why I'm drawing it head to tail. Up here, the vertical velocity is zero. And as the ball comes down, the vertical velocity starts pointing downwards. That's the negative. And at this point, right before it strikes the ground, a millimeter and a millisecond before it strikes the ground, the vertical velocity over here is going to be identical to the initial vertical velocity over here, because that's a mirror image of this point. Whatever gravity did to the vertical velocity going up, it will do the same thing coming down. As gravity diminished the vertical velocity as the ball went up, gravity will increase that vertical velocity as the ball comes down, because it will accelerate it as it comes down. So basically, this point and this point are identical to each other. The horizontal velocities are the same, 
and the vertical velocities are the same, except this one's labeled as negative. So if you ever wanted to find out the hypotenuse, you don't really have to, because it's going to be identical. You could. You could still do the Pythagorean theorem and come up with the resultant. That's going to be the true final velocity, because that takes into account, the hypotenuse takes into account both the x and the y velocities. But that will be exa exactly the same as the beginning. And the angle theta will also be exactly the same. This angle theta, right, when you have this hypotenuse done, and you have this angle theta, it will be identical to the angle theta over here. So let's talk quickly about the time it takes the ball to go from here to there. If somebody says, well, how much time does it take the ball to go from the beginning to the end? All you've got to take into account is you can ask yourself some simple questions. What is the ball's initial velocity? Well, the ball's initial heart x velocity is simply vi cosine theta. And the y velocity is vi sine theta. I'm just simply using your trig function. Sine theta is op equals opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. So the idea is I simply used cosine theta and sine theta to find my vix and my vi1. You'll actually have numbers. Right now I'm not putting in numbers just to keep my drawing kind of tidy. So if I asked you how much time it takes the ball to go from here to there, You've got to ask yourself, well, should I use variables on the x-axis or should I use variables on the y-axis? The answer to that is use the variables that use the axis that gives you the most information. The x-axis only gives you one piece of information, horizontal x-velocity. There is nothing else on the x-axis that we know. However, the y-axis, the movement on the vertical axis, gives you a lot of information. It gives you your initial velocity. It gives you your final velocity, and it gives you your acceleration. So it makes sense to use variables on the x-axis, and remember, on, on the y-axis. It makes sense to use variables on the y-axis, because the y-axis gives you more variables. Remember never to mix variables from the x-axis and the y-axis in the same kinematics equation. You want to keep them separate. The only time you combine x and y is when you do a Pythagorean theorem to find the hypotenuse. Anyways, back to the initial discussion, the time it takes the ball to hit the ground, well, you're going to say, look, what's my initial velocity? Well, your initial velocity is this, vi sine theta. So whatever that value is, you know it. Check. What's your final velocity? Well, I'm going to put a check there, too, because my final velocity is identical to my initial velocity, except, remember, it's a negative. So I'm going to put a negative there, just to remind us. And then you're going to say, what's my acceleration? Well, your acceleration is acceleration of gravity. So check. All three variables are known. And if you're looking for time, just like we said earlier, the acceleration idea, acceleration is final velocity minus initial velocity with time. When you rearrange this to solve for time, final velocity minus initial velocity over acceleration, that will give you your time. What are you going to plug in for your final velocity? This number. Negative this number which is identical to this value. What are you going to plug in for your initial velocity? This value, vi sine theta. What are you going to plug in for a? You can put that negative 10 meters per second squared, and that will give you the time it takes to travel in the air. If I ask you, how much time does it take to get to the highest point? Well, if you know the time it takes to go there and come down, the time to get to the highest point is just half that time. And if you don't like that method, and you just want to find the time directly to get to the highest point, use the same concept. Except if you just want to find the time to the highest point, and you don't like the method of finding the entire time and dividing that by two, because it takes half the time here and half the time here. Um, if you don't like that idea and you want to do it a different way, you certainly can. You can say, look, ball goes starts here and ends here. Starts here and it ends here. What's the initial velocity in the y direction? Vi sine theta. What's the final velocity in the y direction? Zero. So you can still use this equation, except you'd use zero for your final velocity. And for your initial, you'd use vi sine theta. And for your acceleration, you'd still use negative 10. And the time would be determined for half of the trip, which would be exactly half of the total trip. So that's how you find the time. The time the ball spends in the air. Now, the next important question is, how far does the ball travel on the x-axis? 
How far does it go, the range, some people call it? That's not very difficult to do because now you know two important things. You know how much time the ball spends in the air and using vi cosine theta, this is your vi, this is your theta, using vi cosine theta, you know the x velocity. You know how strongly, what's the velocity of the ball sideways. So if you know the x velocity, meaning you know how fast this ball is going sideways, and you know how much time the ball spends in the air, so you know for how long the x velocity gets to push the ball sideways, then simply the x velocity times the time will give you how far the ball goes sideways. And if you want to use a particular equation, you're more comfortable with equations, then feel free to use the average velocity equation to solve for the displacement. What is going to go in here? Your average velocity is going to be vi cosine theta. Why can it be considered a co average? Well, because it's not changing. It's the same. The x velocity is the same. Neglecting air resistance, the x velocity is not changing. So that can go in as your average velocity. And time, how much time does the ball spend in the air? For, so for how long? Does this x velocity get to push the ball sideways? Well, if you know these two variables, you multiply the two, you've got your displacement, x. So if you li like using equations, feel free to use this. But you don't have to. You can use a use conceptual idea that if you know how fast the ball is going sideways and you know for how long the ball's in the air, the product of those two will tell you how far the ball goes. So if the sideways velocity was 20 meters per second, that means the ball is going sideways 20 meters every second. And the ball, let's say, spends five seconds in the air, but it's going 20 meters sideways every second, and it spends five seconds in the air, 20 times five is 100. So that means it'll cover 100 meters in five seconds. So by the time it reaches the bottom, this will be 100 meters downrange. The horizontal displacement will be 100 meters. So once again, you've got to take these concepts, um, and you've got to start understanding, your, understanding these concepts by asking yourselves questions. What is the initial velocity? What's the final velocity? What's the acceleration? Do I want to use variables on the x-axis or do I want to use variables on the y-axis? Which axis gives me more variables to work with? And when the ball is going up and down, it's that y-axis gives you more variables. When the ball is going sideways, then yeah, use the x-axis because the x velocity is the only thing that's impacting the ball sideways, how fast it's going sideways, the x velocity and the time. Finally, last thing I may ask you, I may ask you, what's the height? Let's call that, you can write that as D or Y. I may say, hey, listen, how high does the ball go? This is the easiest part, how high the ball goes. Because you, which variables are you going to use? Are you going to use X variables, variables on the X axis, or variable, variables on the Y axis? The answer to that is if you try to find height, height is a Y variable, so it makes sense. You only use Y variables. So you're going to ask yourself, do I know what's the initial velocity of the ball at this point? And the initial velocity of the ball at this point is VI sine theta. Then you're going to say at the highest point, do I know what the final velocity is? Final velocity is zero. See, we're only using vertical velocities because the vertical velocities are the things that impact the height, how high the ball goes. So if you know the initial velocity and you know the vertical velocity, what other information do you have on the vertical axis, on the y-axis? Gravity. You know the acceleration of gravity. So, you would come back here and you would say, look, what are my knowns? My knowns are, I know what the initial velocity is. Check. VI sine theta. I know what the final velocity is. Check. Zero. I know what the acceleration is. Check. Negative 10 meters per second squared. So I need to find the displacement. You can do this many different ways. The simplest way, use average velocity concept. Average velocity is final velocity plus initial velocity divided by 2. Final velocity plus initial velocity divided by 2 gives you the average velocity. Of course, this is your average velocity on the vertical axis. And then how do you find displacement? Well, average velocity is displacement over time. I'm writing the displacement as y instead of x or d, because this displacement is on the y-axis. You can write it as an x if that makes you more comfortable, or d if that makes you more comfortable. But there you go. 
If you know the average velocity because you know the final initial velocities, you add them together, divide it by two, you know the average velocity now, that average velocity times the time will give you the displacement. That is the simplest way to do it. You don't have to memorize any equations. You just have to understand what average means. So average velocity can be used to find the height of the cliff. Sorry, height of the how high the ball is going in the air. There are other ways to do it too. You could use a kinematics equation that was uh, derived in class. You could use a kinematics equation that says, look, Vf squared is equals to Vi squared plus 2a displacement. Displacement is being labeled as y. So Vf squared final velocity squared equals initial velocity squared plus 2a displacement. Use your algebra skills to rearrange this to solve for your displacement. You know your acceleration is negative 10. You know your initial velocity was vi sine theta. You know your final velocity is 0. Easy. You can solve for your displacement. So if you use algebra and you rearrange this, it's vf squared minus vi squared plus over 2a. Keeping in mind, hey, this is 0. Because the final vertical velocity is zero. So you'll have a negative in the numerator, and because gravity is negative, you'll have a negative in the denominator. So negatives will cancel out, giving you a positive displacement, which is good because the ball's going up. Upwards is positive. If downwards is negative, upwards is positive. So that's how you find how high the ball goes in the air. So this was an ana analyzing projectile motion on when a ball has been fired at an angle of theta. I didn't use numbers, I just simply used variables. You plug in your numbers. But the idea is if you understand the concept, how comfortable are you with the concepts? You don't have to memorize anything. Uh, so, Hopefully, you found this video useful.